The top story is live from the Sky News City studio. The UK economy shrinks unexpectedly in March, but the first quarter still sees slight growth. British software tycoon Mike Lynch is extradited to the United States after losing a long-running legal battle. Elon Musk says he's appointed a new chief executive to run Twitter, but he doesn't divulge the name. Plus, the clock is ticking to the Eurovision Song Contest final. I'll be speaking to its main sponsor, TikTok. Good morning, this is Ian King live in our business and economic news from the heart of the city. The UK economy unexpectedly contracted during March, but still managed to grow during the first quarter of the year. The Office for National Statistics said that the economy contracted by three-tenths of 1% during March. It said that contraction was due mainly to weakness in the services sector, the biggest part of the UK economy, and in particular in the motor trade. The ONS pointed out that new car registrations during March, normally a key month for the trade, remained below pre-pandemic levels. Well, the March contraction followed the economy flatlining during February and growing by half of 1%, in January, it meant that during the first quarter as a whole, the economy grew by one-tenth of one percent. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has just been reacting to the news. One would possibly have predicted even three months ago, and that's partly because of what the Governor of the Bank of England said yesterday, measures in the budget that are helping to uh, help companies to recruit, um, tackle some of the underlying problems in the economy. But there is still much work to do. We still have inflation that is much too high. That's causing a lot of pressure for families up and down the country. That's why we've got to stick to our plan to get inflation down, to get growth up, and to get the economy motoring in the way that we all want. Um, the UK remains the only G7 country in which the quarterly measure of GDP has not recovered to its pre-COVID level. In March, the economy went backwards. When will we get back to where we were three years ago? If you look at the most up-to-date monthly figures, we are now above pandemic levels across the whole economy, but only marginally. And we want to see much faster growth. That's why we need to stick to our plan, above all, to bring inflation down, because that's a drag on growth. But also, part of that plan is to relieve the pressure on families as we go through this difficult period. That's why we've increased this month the national living wage to its highest ever level. Uh, we're doing big payments to help people with their electricity bills. But the long-term solution is not subsidy, it's actually getting inflation down and growth up. And on the quarterly basis, when will we get back to where we were? I think it's for the economists to say um, when we are going to uh, get our quarterly levels back to pre-pandemic levels, but Germany is also in the same situation as we are. The bigger picture here is that growth is picking up much faster than anyone thought possible. That's encouraging. The International Monetary Fund, who are here in Japan with me, say that the British economy is on the right track. But there's much to do. We've still got to get inflation down and we've got to stick to our plan to make sure we remove those pressures on people's weekly shopping bills. Strike action is holding back growth. It's also leading to cancelled operations and school closures. When will you resolve these disputes? We want to resolve the public sector strikes as quickly as we can. We're prepared to be completely reasonable. We will talk about anything except measures that will entrench high inflation because the root cause of the anger of the people who are striking at the moment is that the cost of their weekly shop has gone up by more than their salary. And we don't want to be here in a year's time having the same discussion. So it is challenging for everyone, uh, as we see when interest rates go up. But it's the right thing to do, because if we bring down inflation, we can restore the value of people's pay packets and stop people having to worry about prices going up. Chancellor, thank you. Joining me now is our business correspondent, Gurpreet Nawan. Gurpreet, bit of a surprise, this number. It looks like uh, consumer-facing services was the uh, main drag on growth. Yes, that's right, Ian. These figures were worse than expected, and we weren't exactly going into this with particularly high expectations. In March, the economy contracted by 0.3%. Economists were expecting it to flatline. But in the first three months of the year, the first quarter, it did manage to eke out some growth of 0.1%. And we're really 
being hit on multiple fronts. Widespread strike action is dampening growth in the public sector, but also a toxic mix of high inflation and high taxes are weighing heavily on disposable incomes, which means people are a bit more cautious about going out to spend. The Office for National Statistics said today that the consumer-facing services sector that includes everything from shops and restaurants to hairdressers and travel agencies, shrank by 0.8% in March. And in the first three months of the year, consumer spending was flat. It's largely still being supported by people running down their lockdown savings. So there's not a huge amount to celebrate here, but Jeremy Hunt, as you heard, was trying to put a positive spin on it, saying at least the economy is growing. And when you consider where we were at the beginning of the year, when the outlook looked pretty bleak, Many economists were saying that we'd already be in recession. You can see the positives in it. We haven't had that much talked about recession. And the Bank of England said yesterday that we might avoid one altogether, actually managing to eke out some growth. The problem is that although we've managed to avoid a recession, we're starting from a pretty low base. And we're the only economy in the G7 that still hasn't recovered to its pre-pandemic size. So hardly a massive cause for celebration. OK, thanks, Gurpreet. Well, joining me for more now on this is Paul Dales. He's Chief UK Economist at Capital Economics. Uh, Paul, good to see you this morning. I mean, this number did take uh, a few people by surprise. What, what had you been looking for? Um, we thought the economy would be flat in March rather than contracting. Um, but I don't think we should overreact to this because... Um, on my analysis, I think a lot of the weakness in March itself was due to the strikes, which to some extent are a temporary drag on the economy, hopefully, and also actually the unusually wet weather. It was the wettest March for 40 years, um, and that meant a lot of people actually just stayed at home um, rather than go out and spending. So I'd be surprised if actually um, GDP didn't rebound a bit in April. Is there any possibility of this being a rogue number? We obviously uh, often get revisions to these uh, first cuts from the ONS. Oh, it's always possible. I mean, economic statistics are hard to compile and they get um, changed as new information comes along all the time. Um, but for me, the really big points here is that we know that the UK economy has been hit by two dual drags, the effect of high inflation and now the effect of higher interest rates. I think what's happened is the UK actually should be quite commended because uh, it's avoided a recession so far. But for me, the real concern is that all the drag from higher interest rates has yet to come through. Households and businesses haven't seen the full effect on their borrowing costs. So I'm a bit concerned that it's too early to sound the all clear on um, the recession call. I think there's still a risk that the UK might fall into recession at some point later this year. That's a very good point you make. I mean, it was instructive yesterday for me that Andrew Bailey said that households had only felt really about a third of the interest rate rises that we've uh, had to date. It kind of begs the question why in that case they, they went again yesterday. Yes, I think it's a case really that they, they know they've done a lot of work um, to call uh, inflation and they know that will have some effect. The problem is they just don't quite know how much they need to do and what the effect is going to be. So for me, it feels like um, they decided um, to raise interest rates once again to 4.5%, um, just because there is a risk that inflation might be a bit stickier than it expects. And I think that's such a reasonable, sensible decision. Um, I do feel, though, as we are coming quite close to the peak in interest rates. I'm not sure whether it will be 4.5 or 4.75, um, but I don't think we'll go much further because at some point the bank will probably say, OK, we've done quite a lot. We think the effects of higher interest rates will start to have a bigger impact on the economy and we just need to wait and see uh, for that effect to come through. Absolutely. Paul, you mentioned the strikes uh, just now. I mean, it was quite interesting in the ONS release here. It said that strike action had clearly had an impact on GDP, but it find it hard to quantify. Well, it's incredibly hard to quantify um, because um, there's wide range in effects. I mean, even if you just were to count the number of, let's say, operations that didn't get done in the health service, you could probably quantify that. But for train strikes, for example, um, you can quantify how many trains don't travel and tickets that weren't bought. But then there's all the people who might have not gone to work 
um, and couldn't work that day. And then there's other people who uh, traveled on buses uh, or taxis. So there's an increase in output there. It's, it's really hard to quantify it. But what we know is that to some extent, the strikes have held back GDP growth a bit. But um, I don't think they are the reason why the UK economy, for example, over the last couple of years has struggled relative to some other economies in Europe and North America. They're a very tiny part of the overall story, if, if you ask me. Paul, one, th one more uh, point about the March number I wanted to ask you about is um, if there is a crumb of comfort in it, it's the fact that manufacturing expanded during the month. I mean, we've had quite a protracted period of weakness in manufacturing. What was going on there, do you think? Well, I think there's some relief here from um, the uh, contraction in uh, lots of supply chains um, from the pandemic. And um, that particularly hurt the auto car production sector. And those uh, supply shortages eased last year. So I think manufacturers have started to benefit from that. They're able to uh, produce a bit more simply because they can get their parts. Um, there's also been a bit of a synchronized upturn in activity in lots of uh, European uh, and North American countries and China as well, actually. Um, so the manufacturing sector is more exposed to global trends and um, the UK's manufacturing sector has benefited to some degree um, from just um, other economies around the world starting to perform a bit better as well. OK, Paul, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. My pleasure. There's some breaking news now, and the British businessman Dr Mike Lynch has been extradited to the United States. The founder and former chief executive of the software company Autonomy landed in San Francisco yesterday, weeks after losing a long-running legal battle. He's expected to stand trial over allegations that he manipulated Autonomy's accounts to inflate its value ahead of its sale to Hewlett Packard. Dr Lynch has always denied those allegations. We're joining me now is our city editor Mark Kleinman, who broke the story this morning. Mark, this is going to be really, really controversial. A lot of British business people were, were right behind Mike Lynch. Yeah, that's right, uh, Ian. Mike Lynch has always argued that if he were to face uh, criminal charges over uh, the sale of autonomy to Hewlett-Packard, then that trial should take place in the UK. After all, autonomy uh, was a London-listed co company uh, based in the UK and uh, was audited in Britain uh, as well. But uh, as you said, he's been fighting a long-running uh, legal battle to avoid extradition. He lost the final round of that challenge in the High Court uh, last month. So today's news is really inevitable. He arrived in San Francisco yesterday uh, lunchtime and immediately uh, went to a bail hearing at a US district court in California where the, uh, the judge ordered him to pay a $100 million bail bond to secure his uh, release. It's not clear whether that has been paid or whether Mr Lynch uh, will pay it. But it, it, it is an incredibly controversial uh, case, Ian, because of its use of the extradition treaty between the UK and the US. A number of leading British business figures, the likes of Brent Hoberman, for example, the founder of LastMinute.com, uh, argued in a letter earlier this year to Rishi Sunak that this was an unreasonable use of the treaty between the two uh, governments and that it was excessive and not appropriate. Uh, of course, we've now seen that uh, Dr Lynch has been extradited uh, to the US where he will face trial, cr a criminal trial at uh, a future date. Uh, so obviously very bad news for, for Dr Lynch that he has lost uh, his extradition battle and he is now in custody in the US. All right, Mark, thanks for that. Some other stories for you now. And shares of THG fell by as much as 20% this morning after the online retailing platform said it had ended talks with the US private equity firm Apollo over a possible takeover. THG, which specialises in lines such as health and beauty, said the sum Apollo had indicated it was prepared to pay for the business had fallen short of the valuation the board put on the company. It said the board had therefore concluded there was no longer any merit in continuing to engage with Apollo. THG added that it was continuing to see improvements in its profitability and cash flow. 
The drugs giant GSK said this morning it sold £804 million worth of shares in Halion, the consumer healthcare business it spun off last year. It said it continues to own 10.3% of Halion, who, which owns brands including Sensodyne Toothpaste, Centrum Minerals and Voltarol Pain Relief. Well, GSK said it and the drugs giant Pfizer, which owns a further 32% of Halion, had agreed not to sell any more shares in the company for the next 60 days. Shares of Halion, which was demerged from GSK in July last year, are actually up one and three quarter percent this morning. And Elon Musk has said overnight he has appointed a new chief executive for Twitter. In a tweet on the social media platform, Mr Musk, who bought Twitter for $44 billion last year, said she will be starting in around six weeks. Mr Musk did not disclose the identity of Twitter's new chief executive, but the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Linda Yaccarino, who's head of advertising at the broadcaster NBC Universal, is in talks to take the job. NBC Universal has the same parent company as Sky News. Well, a mixed session on Wall Street last night was followed by similarly mixed trade overnight for equities in the Asia-Pacific region. Both Hong Kong and Shanghai fell on concerns over Chinese growth, but the Nikkei in Tokyo hit its best level since November 2021 on some solid corporate earnings updates. Well, in Europe, stocks are heading into the weekend on a largely upbeat note too. Here's the picture. All of the main indices in continental Europe in positive territory right now. Talking points today include stronger than expected earning update from Richemont. That's the owner of brands such as Cartier and Mont Blanc. Its shares are ahead some 6.5% in Zurich, and that's given a lift to other luxury goods uh, players. You'll notice that the CAC Quarante in France is up nearly 1%. That's quite heavily weighted towards luxury goods stocks. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in positive territory, up nearly half of 1% right now in a broad-based rally. The leading blue-chip gainer currently is the Lloyds of London insurer Beasley Group. The shares up 5.25% uh, following a trading update earlier on this morning. Meanwhile, the private equity firm 3i continues to be wanted after its results yesterday and is ahead by some 2.5%. On the downside, well, as you can see, Vodafone is off by more than three quarters of 1%. There's some adverse broker comment uh, chipping away at it there. Diageo, which you can see in the middle of the screen there, off by 1.5% for similar reasons. Outside the FTSE, the ready meal and sandwich maker Bacavor. Its shares are up by some 3.5%. There was a bit of chunky director buying there in that stock yesterday. But ITV, as you can see, remains under a bit of a cloud following Thursday's trading update. It's currently off another one and three quarter percent on the foreign exchange markets, well, it's been a fairly uh, quiet morning, to be honest with you, uh, despite those GDP figures. Sterling ahead by a tenth of 1% against the US dollar. It's ahead by a quarter of 1% against the euro. The single currency, meanwhile, off uh, by just under a sixth of 1% against the greenback. As for the oil price, well, that is currently on course for its fourth consecutive weekly fall. That's largely down to the big reverse it suffered yesterday. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $74.71 a barrel. That's off a third of 1%. Joining me this morning is Sophie Lundier. She's lead equity analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Sophie, good to see you. Um, let's start with THG. I mean... Uh, Bit of a, a bit of a disappointment this for long-suffering shareholders. That's certainly one way one way to put it. Really, really dramatic moves this morning. They're down as much as thirteen percent. Um, really, they are in an incredibly difficult position. Let's not forget they've only been listed for a few years, and they're down well over ninety percent on that on that price. Um, so really difficult times. And I think what we need to keep in mind is that the path to to better profits for them is very unclear. Um, and what we've seen is there were talks of a takeover with Apollo. That's fallen apart, and and that's why the shares are suffering so badly this morning. I mean, Matt Moulding, the founder and CEO, is a big, big shareholder himself. Do you think he's calling the shots in this in terms of how the board responds? Yes, I do think there's certainly an element of that of that going on. You know, he's been very, very vocal, particularly around the takeover chatter in terms of what he will and won't accept. Um, that's certainly up for debate about whether or not that's that's the right course. Um, but I would say that there's there's certainly a, an element of strong control from his side. Yes. Looking more broadly at the uh, FTSE 100 today, I mean, as I mentioned, it is in positive territory. Any, any firm reasons for that right now? I mean, it's, it's not been on a bad run lately. It hasn't, you know, really. It's, it's ending the week with a bit of a spring in its step, which is always nice to see. Um, frankly, what we're seeing is that the market is incredibly happy to hear that the economy is expanding. You know, we were expecting contractions until very recently, you know, that big revision that we heard of yesterday. So there's that. Um, also, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that our labour market is still very tight. Now, as much as that's a problem for inflation, when you pick that apart, what it tells you is that there's a lot of money still pumping around the economy because people have a lot more security, job security. 
Um, and when people feel confident in that way, they're spending in the economy. So that's helpful as well. And the final point on that is that obviously an, an, an expanding economy and a healthier economy helps the banks, which we know the FTSE is very much weighted towards. Absolutely. Of course, two thirds of uh, earnings in the FTSE come from overseas as well. And uh, clearly economies like the US and parts of the Eurozone are doing quite well. Yes, absolutely. And there's been some, some movements in currency, obviously, at the moment as well. Um, and yeah, the overseas is very, very important for the FTSE. So as much as you might be looking domestically, it's the domestic market. Those overseas performances are incredibly important. Now, what about the oil price? As I mentioned, uh, this is four weeks in a row it's fallen now. There was a big sell-off yesterday, mainly on US gasoline inventories. But there's a bit of a tug of war going on here. I mean, it's still quite trading in a, quite a tight range. Yeah, very, very tight range. And really, this is quite a sharp reversal from, um, from upswings we've seen more recently. And essentially, what we're seeing is uh, the Biden administration initially said that they were going to cut a lot of production, um, which caused a spike um, because of the supply constraints. But there has actually been um, a bit of a, a higher inventory levels than expected in the US coupled with demand concerns, particularly in the biggest importer, which is China. Um, so essentially, at the moment, it appears that global recessionary fears are winning that, that tug of war, which is why we're seeing that downwards pressure on the price. All right, Sophie, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Great to have you in the studio this Thank morning. You. Thank you. Still to come here on Ian King Live, the TikTok takeover of Eurovision. I'll be speaking next to its general manager for marketing and operations in the UK and Ireland. Stay tuned. So eight years ago I arrived here, 2015, it was an election in Eurovision and got sucked in immediately into politics and Eurovision. And uh, it was the first year Australia was in and I was thinking, Australia are in? You know, what's going on here? Then I noticed over the years that there's a few other countries that are not European technically either in there. Israel's in there, Azerbaijan and things like that. And I thought, why shouldn't we be in here? You know, we're uh, a colonial country. We've got a lot of links. There's a lot of New Zealanders here, a lot of business networks and things like that. So um, we want to have someone to support each year. OK, to that end, there's a video that's been released. Um, let's have a look at it and then you can tell me. English muffins, Dutch ovens, European things, we love them. I've got German second cousins, let us into Eurovision. We're not bluffing, we'll be stunning. You got space, you kicked out the Russians. You want beers, we'll bring a dozen. Let us into Eurovision. Open up, open up. Yeah, so we, um, we actually came up with the idea, we'd been talking about, like, why isn't New Zealand in Eurovision? Came up with the idea, it just happened to be at, like, a Kiwi networking party, and I met uh, the, like, cousin's best friend's dog groomer Twice of... Removed, yeah. yeah, yeah, of, uh, of Laura in the band there. It's Laura and Joseph, and, uh, and it sort of all clicked together. Just sort of felt like two worlds colliding, like, right at the right time. We dropped them a line in typical Kiwi fashion. They were just like, yeah, yeah, we're in. Okay. In 48 hours, they had a demo of the song to us. So we're the feet on the ground here to sort of make it happen. They're still back in New Zealand, but they'll be touring here later this year, and hopefully we can sort of give it a, another push. Amazing. Yeah, it's like there's a, you know, a, a, a group of people that are really, really, really passionate about it, and uh, part of the issue is obviously time difference. So when it's kicking off over here, it's first thing in the morning, and mm -hmm. we're going to try and make a movement to make that the best breakfast TV to watch in New Zealand <laughs> and try and grow that based. Welcome back. Now, can't have escaped your notice that tomorrow evening is the final of the Eurovision Song Contest. This year's event is being held in Liverpool and for the second year in a row, the Chinese video platform TikTok is the main sponsor as its official entertainment partner. Well, all over the city of Liverpool, you can see last year's runner-up Sam Ryder fronting a new TikTok campaign to encourage other artists to launch their careers on the video site. Well, joining me now from Liverpool is James Stafford. He's TikTok's General Manager for Marketing and Operations in the UK and Ireland. Uh, James, welcome to you. Before we get on to uh, what you're doing with Eurovision, obviously TikTok's become quite a controversial brand here in the UK. Concerns over online safety for children, more recently national security. I mean, can, what would you say to parents who are nervous about their children using TikTok? Yeah, firstly, thanks for having me. I'm incredibly excited. So, uh, 
you know, we work with all of our stakeholders, uh, parents, uh, with governments, with all of our partners like uh, uh, Eurovision and, and BBC to uh, listen to their specific concerns that they have around uh, using the platform from a safety or from a data point of view uh, and address them. We're more than happy to be transparent about the plans that we have for protecting uh, UK data within uh, Europe. And we talk you know, very openly about all of the products and features we have that parents can use uh, to, to keep themselves safe and to keep their children safe on the platform. But we are really proud of the um, joyful and inclusive and entertaining experience that we uh, provide. And we don't, uh, we don't shy from that. I mean, the government is pushing through an online safety bill aimed at uh, keeping children safe and keeping big tech companies to account. Are you supportive of that endeavour? Yeah, we, we support any uh, effort to, um, you know, to, to ensure that children and, and all users of the internet can be safe and protected when they, when they use that. So we're working really collaboratively with the government and we'll support um, uh, any efforts. Obviously, the UK government has just banned TikTok from its uh, official devices on security concerns. Have you made any representations to the government about that? Yeah, so we, we expressed that we were disappointed with the decision, but we, uh, you know, we understand that uh, the, the UK government uh, has advised that use of TikTok, like other, other you know, social devices on corporate devices, should be uh, avoided. And you know, we actively, proactively engage uh, with, with all of our stakeholders, including governments, to understand what those concerns are and share what our plans are um, you know, in, in the area of online safety and in the area of data security to make sure that we can uh, give confidence to all of our partners that we are um, a, a responsible partner in this area. So are, you, are talks ongoing with the UK government then? Do you, do you think there's any chance of getting them to reverse this decision? I won't, I won't speculate on, on the decision of the government, but we're, we're definitely engaged with, with um, you know, all of our stakeholders, including the UK government, on addressing what their concerns are. How much data from TikTok users is made available to the Chinese government? So no data um, from, from TikTok users. TikTok is, is not a Chinese company. TikTok is a global company headquartered uh, in, in Los Angeles and Singapore. Um, user data from the UK uh, is, is currently stored in the US and Singapore and very soon will be stored uh, in, in Europe. If the Chinese government requested um, the use of data, we, we, would, we would reject that. It's, it's not. Um, you know, uh, sovereign countries like the UK are not compelled to uh, you know, break their own data security rules on the request of any government, including China. Well, let's talk about what you're doing with, with Eurovision. Obviously, you're broadcasting a lot of the concert yourself. Do, do you see yourself as being in competition here with the BBC necessarily? No, absolutely. I mean, we are a partner of the BBC and we have uh, been really open about the fact that we would be really successful as a platform if the BBC is incredibly successful at, you know, uh, making sure that as many people as possible tune in on, on uh, Saturday night to watch the competition live. So we are proactively partnering with them to make sure that we're capturing as much attention and audience on TikTok and, and at eight o'clock uh, switching them all over to watch uh, live. You know, we're a partner um, uh, of broadcasters and we're incredibly uh, proud to, to work with them. We've learned overnight that the European Broadcasting Union has uh, turned down a request from President Zelensky to address the event. Would you have liked to have seen him being able to speak? Uh, I mean, I, I won't, I won't uh, uh, comment on behalf of the, the EBU or, or President Zelensky. Uh, you know, we respect their decisions. I think, um, you know, they, they know absolutely what is right for Eurovision and the, uh, you know, the spirit of the contest. Now, you're obviously, as well as uh, partnering Eurovision, you're also working with Visit Liverpool to try and boost tourism to, to the city there. What, what sort of initiatives have you got underway? Yeah, from the very start um, of, of this project, we were so excited by the, uh, you know, the, the, the joy of Eurovision, but importantly, the opportunity that this can bring to the host city uh, and to the businesses that depend on, on that. You know, Liverpool is highly dependent on tourism, especially music tourism, um, has amazing live uh, venues and, and cultural institutions. They were decimated by COVID. So at the heart of our partnership has been you know, revival, economic opportunity and cultural revival. So we are, you can see behind me, you can see uh, we've erected some busking spots for local artists to uh, perform, uh, you know, in, not just in front of the visiting crowds, but to the 150 million Europeans who use TikTok. Uh, we partnered with uh, small businesses, about 200 uh, businesses and cultural institutions are now on board and we're uh, helping them to promote themselves uh, across uh, Europe. You'll see, you'll see billboards, including one uh, just over there, uh, showcasing some of the most important TikTok businesses uh, on the platform. Um, and we've got about 50 of the biggest TikTok creators from across Europe 
uh, here in Liverpool visiting, uh, reviewing all of those places, visiting the institutions and you know, really compelling their audiences back home to come and visit Liverpool. So we hope that will uh, leave a really successful lasting legacy for Eurovision on the economic uh, opportunity and cultural uh, impact of Liverpool. Well, it looks like you brought the sunshine with you, James, anyway. It looks a lot brighter when you are <laughs> than it is here in London this morning. So enjoy the event. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Still to come here on Ian King Live, we're going to be speaking to the founder and chief executive of the athleisure brand Gymshark about its plans for the future. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, the athleisure brand Gymshark has not had many setbacks since it was founded 11 years ago by the entrepreneur Ben Francis. The business was valued at more than £1 billion when, in 2020, the US private equity firm General Atlantic acquired a 21% stake. So eyebrows were raised when the company recently reported a 40% decline in full-year pre-tax profits to £27.8 million. Pounds. Well, joining me now is Gymshark's founder and chief executive, Ben Francis. Ben, great to see you this morning. I don't want to get too bogged down in the numbers, but but, um, I mean, the decline in profits that you announced recently, that was all largely down to higher costs because you're investing so much. Yeah, I mean, we were affected like uh, most other companies with increased material costs, freight costs, logistics costs and all of these things. But um, we also are aware of the fact that we want to build a truly iconic uh, global brand. So we also didn't want to slow down investments from a brand point of view during that period as well. You haven't taken a dividend for two years. I mean, it feels like you're investing most of your profits right now back into the business. Yes, absolutely. Like, like I said, we, our real ambition and my, my personal ambition is I'd love to build a, 
like I said, a, a British brand, but a globally iconic brand and ultimately a brand that lasts longer than I do. So you can't invest in your brand just when times are good. You have to invest in the brand consistently over a prolonged period of time. And that's what we're really focusing on doing now. Now, in October last year, you you opened your first store in London's West End. Has that traded in line with your expectations? It's actually it's been ahead. It's genuinely been ahead pretty much every single day and year to day. It's it's a it's a well way ahead. So we're really 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 pleased. And and being honest, that was that was tough for us because we've only ever sold sort of single orders online. So so to go into an offline strategy was operationally difficult for us. But I'm really really proud of what that store has done. And not only has it been really successful from a commercial perspective, but I think we've also shown the retail world what can be achieved with a store because it's quite an, an incredible experience as well. Has it whetted your appetite to open more outlets then? Uh, I think it's something that we're looking at now. I think, again, if we zoom out and look at building out a 100-year brand, I genuinely think a 100-year brand needs multiple touch points. We need touch points that are online, that are offline. And I think in the future, it's definitely, definitely something that we should be looking at. Obviously, having been previously online, you had a really good insight into your consumers and the sort of uh, things that they were interested in and the demographics and so on. Is that harder in an offline environment? Uh, yes and no, because I think in an offline environment, you'll get less of the large quantities of hard data, but then you can have some really, really important and interesting conversations with customers. And even I try and get into the store at least once or twice a month and just chatting to people about what they like, what they don't like, improvements in the products. I think those things can sometimes be underestimated as to just how important they are. You mentioned earlier on uh, freight costs and other supply chain issues. Are you starting to see those abating now? Yes, yes, we are. And I think the going back to the numbers, Ian, the, the numbers were accounts that were ended uh, July last year. So in the last, particularly the last few months, we've seen costs sort of start to ease and get better and the business is continuing to grow. So we're really optimistic about the next sort of year moving forward. And how do you assess the strength of consumer confidence right now? I mean, obviously, we've had news this morning that UK GDP unexpectedly contracted in March. A lot of that is being put down to lower disposable incomes. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, we're very, very uh, spread globally. I mean, I think something like 60, 70 percent of our revenue is outside of the UK. Half of that's in North America. Uh, specifically in the UK, we've actually seen really, really good performance the last couple of months. And it's been a little bit surprising, if I'm honest, given the um, the outlook and the, the I guess the noises coming from the media and, like you say, the interest rise that's just happened. But um, so recently, we've seen really, really strong UK performance. And we do think that that's down to the store and the brand and just having a really strong and clear proposition in the market. You mentioned there uh, the importance of, of North America to you in particular. Is, is that in, right now your priority in terms of growing the business and growing the brand? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we've got a few priorities at the moment. But yeah, the US is certainly one of those. It's the biggest active wear and fitness market in the world. Uh, we're still very small in the United States. We've got a growing presence. So yeah, it's a big priority and we see it as a big, big opportunity moving forward. All right, Ben, we've got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Hope to see you again in future. It's been great talking to you today. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think we might have a bit of breaking news to bring you now. Uh, we've just heard that the former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has arrived at a court in Islamabad. You can see the pictures on your screen there. He was under heavy security cover as his supporters clashed with police elsewhere in the city. You'll recall, of course, Imran Khan was arrested earlier in the week and that was subsequently overturned as being unlawful by the courts in Islamabad. More on that throughout the morning as we get it here on Sky News. Now, during a cost of living crisis, some consumers may be tempted to squeeze every last available drop from their household appliances rather than shell out to replace them when they break. Well, that, in theory, should be good news for Domestic and General, the UK's leading provider of appliance care. But the company, which employs a network of 9,000 engineers, has other challenges of its own, including supporting the push for energy efficiency. Well, joining me now is the Chief Executive of Domestic and General, Matthew Crummock. Matthew, good to see you good morning. this morning. I mean, is, is that a fair point? Are call-outs increasing as people try and keep their appliances going for longer? Well, certainly the cost of living crisis has meant uh, a lot of people have deferred uh, new appliance purchases, certainly in the last year or so. And actually, repairing appliances and making them last longer has been a key consideration for many people. Uh, certainly that's what we've seen. 
Uh, we, uh, a lot of, much of our business, vast majority is on a subscription basis. We have nearly 5 million customers in the UK. Uh, they pay monthly. Uh, they're able to cancel at any time on that plan. Yeah, we've maintained our retention level of those customers at 85%, actually. And the reason we believe that is because they, customers value actually being able to call up and have somebody out repair the appliance. Most people like repairing their appliances and keeping their own appliances. They like their, their own washing machines, their dishwashers. They even call them names sometimes, would you believe it? <laughs> but actually, they, they like keeping them. So. Well, having tried to repair my washing machine, I think they're mental for thinking that. <laughs> um, what about costs? What are you seeing there? <clears throat> on, on the cost of the actual plan itself? Well, yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we're, we're very thoughtful about that. And uh, so we ran some proprietary research uh, uh, in, the last, in the last few months looking at how consumers uh, rate this particular subscription, which is an insurance product. And actually, it's at the bottom of the pile uh, relative to all the other subscriptions for things that people would cancel. Right. And the reason it is is because, actually, when you take those nearly 5 million customers, the demographic of those 5 million matches almost identically the demographic of the UK. So you have people on low incomes with our policies, and you have people at high incomes. And the people on low income buy it for protection because they don't want to have to spend £500 or £400 on a new appliance, and the people at the high end actually buy it for convenience. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Now, so, but actually, they see value in that, and that's why we've maintained retention. Um, now, obviously, you know, we, uh, we um, uh, adjust pricing as we go through, through the year, uh, but we do that very, very cautiously. And obviously, the fact we've been able to main rate, maintain retention throughout the years at this level is an indication of the, of the value. What's the typical cost of a policy? Well, it can just be a few pounds on a starting uh, for, a, for a starter machine, and it depends very much, of course, uh, the type of machine. You know, uh, at the high end, you've got uh, some machines which can cost thousands of pounds. At uh, the low end, uh, a bit less. Uh, and uh, it's, this is not like insuring a person on a car. You don't drive a washing machine, and so you, you know, they're, they're very much pr quite predictable uh, in uh, how they break down and what they do. So uh, it's very cheap at the beginning a few pounds to, to, uh, to, to protect that. But as you go through the lifetime uh, of a machine, let's say across the lifetime, an average of 10 years, we might repair a machine three times. That's interesting. What about uh, parts? We've been talking a lot about supply chain shortages lately. Has, has that been an issue over the last 12 to 15 months? Yeah, it, it was certainly an issue uh, at, at the sort of very peak of the supply chain crisis. Um, uh, and it's very much trying to get the right parts at the right time. Um, uh, if you imagine our 5 million customers, we have everything from uh, washing machines to tumble dryers to TVs uh, and a network of 9,000 end years to support that. So the, the possible combinations and all of that and the right spare parts at the right time is quite mind-blowing. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, bringing data and using machines to help us better predict and better organise ourselves and our engineer partners to try and get to the right place at the right time. Sounds like something for AI, that. Now, uh, what about energy efficiency? Is that something that consumers are necessarily fixated on during a cost of living crisis? I, th I think, um, for, for us at least, what we see is, uh, is, a, is a real focus on extending the life of the appliance. They, uh, and and we, we, don't, uh, we see, certainly, on new appliance purchases, more focus on energy efficiency. Uh, we hear Consumers, we do call listening, I do call listening, and we hear consumers talk about how energy efficient is this machine. But that tends to be for new appliances. For existing ones, it's more about extending that life out. And the longer it lasts, clearly, the better it is, because you're not then shipping a new one halfway around the world, taking the old one away. Uh, and that's really why our business has been so sustainable, really, over time. And that's why we think it's a sustainable business, both economically and environmentally. All right, Matthew, loads I wanted to ask you, but we're out of time, I'm afraid. Nice to see you. We haven't had you on the programme for a while. So yeah, thanks very you. much. Thank you. Time now for a look at this morning's business pages and the Financial Times splashes its print edition with the Bank of England's interest rate rise yesterday. Inside, the paper's economics editor Chris Giles writes that the bank's governor, Andrew Bailey, faced tough questioning on the credibility of the bank's forecasting. The FT's currently leading its digital editions, meanwhile, with a very interesting story that PwC is racing to contain the global fallout of an Australian leak scandal on its business after it emerged that the uh, company used government tax plans to advise its tech clients. 
The Times leads its business pages with a Bank of England rate rise, but it also reports that Revolut's chief financial officer and UK banking chief are leaving in what it says is the latest in a series of senior departures from the company. Daily Telegraph also leads with the Bank of England and homes in on its warning that Britain faces elevated levels of inflation now for nearly two years. Telegraph also reports on a meeting between supermarket chiefs and John Glenn, the chief secretary to the Treasury, in which they told him government regulations were pushing up their costs and contributing to a surge in food prices. Well, joining me now as ever on a Friday morning is the financial markets commentator and evening standard columnist Neil Collins. Neil, good to see you this morning. One story that caught your eye is uh, Shell, the Church of England pension fund, uh, is voting against the reappointment of the CEO. Yes, I, they don't think that Shell is going green quickly enough and they are protesting. I mean, they don't have many shares. They used to have quite a few, but they've sold them down. So their £1 million total investment is really not going to move the dial at Shell. But I suspect others will follow them. So there is a bit of a problem here. But um, my point is that it's all very well to uh, highlight the problems uh, of trying to turn an oil company into a, a, a business of, uh, as I described, as sunbeams and uh, windmills. Um, but it's a very difficult thing to do, and it's extremely difficult to do it while making money. And the, uh, the remit for the people at the top of Shell, of course, is not to do uh, to save the world, it's to make a decent return on the vast capital that they employ. And they, the people who are protesting don't really seem to grasp this. I put it this way, if Shell decided it was not going to do any more oil drilling, then I suspect that the executives would be on the end of a lawsuit from, from the US investors because the valuation put on Exxon, which has got a much more robust approach to the, uh, to the green lobby, uh, is about 50% higher than Shell. So if Shell was on the same rating as Exxon, it would be worth £80 billion more than it is today. So, you know, that is the, the, num the stark numbers, if you like. Um, the other point that I think I've made in my column is that the amount of so-called damage done by the Western oil companies is tiny compared to the amount of damage done by uh, other doubtful operators in strange parts of the world. Um, and the example I quote is in Turkmenistan, where the extraction of methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, is essentially uh, so inefficient that it contributes more to, uh, to the output of, for, for CO2 equivalent than the entire United Kingdom. And that's just from their gas fields, from gas which is wasted. So uh, you know, I do think the protesters, although I'm sure they're well-meaning, really should get a sense of proportion. And I suspect they're attacking Shell because they can, uh, rather than because they think it's really going to make any difference. Yes, extraordinary uh, statistic, that from uh, Turkmenistan you've just quoted there. Before I let you go, Neil, what is, what's your reaction to Mike Lynch's uh, extradition? I mean, it's something that uh, you and I have both written about over the years. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, um, hat tip to uh, Sky News for, for, for uh, revealing the scoop that he was being extra extradited. He's now gone on a $100 million bail. Um, his defence seems to me to be basically saying, well, we're a British company, I'm British, and it therefore should be held here. Uh, and I think that in terms of the, the, the substance of the complaints that Hewlett-Packard have against him, the, the, the judges on more than one occasion have said that they are very substantial, the, the allegations of fraud. Uh, and really... The, the, the place to have them uh, answered is in the courts. Uh, the thing that always puzzled me about Autonomy, his company, was that it was valued very highly, but there was always a minority of analysts who said, this thing shouldn't fly. 
they didn't actually say fraud, but they said, we can't make the numbers work. We think they're confusing hardware sales and software sales, uh, and we don't like it at all. So uh, despite that, Hewlett Packard went ahead and paid $11 billion. It seems to me that their complete failure to do due diligence is one of the main reasons why it, it was such a mess. I mean, they paid a vast amount. And they had to write off $8 billion of it uh, when they realized what the uh, true position was. So, you know, it's all very well them having a go uh, at Mike Lynch and saying, you know, we want to see him in court. Uh, it does strike me to some extent as being sort of revenge and spite. Yeah, caveat emptor. Neil, good to see you this morning. Thank you. Pleasure. Still to come here on Ian King Live, how artificial intelligence could impact customer service and help those most vulnerable. Don't go away. Eight years ago I arrived here, 2015, it was an election in Eurovision and got sucked in immediately into politics and Eurovision. And uh, it was the first year Australia was in and I was thinking, Australia are in? You know, what's going on here? Then I noticed over the years that there's a few other countries that are not European technically either in there. Israel's in there, Azerbaijan and things like that. And I thought, why shouldn't we be in here? You know, we're uh, a colonial country. We've got a lot of links. There's a lot of New Zealanders here, a lot of business networks and things like that. So um, we want to have someone to support each year. OK, to that end, there's a video that's been released. Um, let's have a look at it and then you can tell me. English muffins, Dutch ovens, European things, we love them. I've got German second cousins, let us into Eurovision. We're not bluffing, we'll be stunning. You got space, you kicked out the Russians. You want beers, we'll bring a dozen. Let us into Eurovision. Open up, open up, and let us in. Showing up. Yeah, so we, um, we actually came up with the idea, we'd been talking about, like, why isn't New Zealand in Eurovision? Came up with the idea, it just happened to be at, like, a... Kiwi networking party and I met uh, the like cousins, best friends, dog groomer Twice of removed, yeah. yeah yeah of uh, of Laura in the band there it's Laura and Joseph and uh, and it sort of all clicked together just sort of felt like two worlds colliding like right at the right time we dropped them a line in typical Kiwi fashion they were just like yeah yeah we're in okay. in 48 hours they had a demo of the song to us so we're the feet on the ground here to sort of make it happen they're still back in New Zealand but they'll be touring here later this year and hopefully we can sort of give it a, another push. Amazing. Yeah, it's like there's a, you know, a, a, a group of people that are really, really, really passionate about it. And uh, part of the issue is obviously time difference. So when it's kicking off over here, it's first thing in the morning. And mm. we're going to try and make a movement to make that the best breakfast TV to watch in New Zealand <laughs> and try and grow that base. the latest news and insight. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Report, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Welcome back. Now, as we've been reporting on this programme during the last couple of weeks, businesses are working hard to integrate generative AI like ChatGPT into their operations. One field in which the technology is seen as offering particular advantage is in improving customer service. An example could be in helping utility companies set up dedicated phone lines for vulnerable customers, something energy companies were this week ordered to do by the regulator 
Ofgem. Well, joining me now live from New York is Barak Alam. He's the chief executive of NICE, the $12 billion global enterprise software provider. Barak, good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining me at such an unsociable hour. Um, how can AI help in a situation like this? Thank you very much for having me again. Good morning uh, from, uh, from New York. Uh, AI is a true game changer for the customer service uh, uh, space. It actually tackles three very uh, long-standing challenges that uh, enterprises are facing when it comes to customer service. The first one is the lack of uh, skilled labor, the ability to take decision at a very high pace and velocity, and of course, mass personalization at scale, something that we as consumers all want when it comes to getting service from our providers. Barak, how difficult is it for, for businesses to, gen to integrate uh, generative AI into their custom support systems? So it's actually not that easy. I know that we have all already somewhat experienced different generative AI technologies, and you know, it does humanize the conversation for us as uh, human beings. But when it comes to enterprises, they have different goals. They have the ability or the need to protect the brand and provide certain type of services to their consumers. And of course, they have different business goals. So just taking generative AI as is to their operation is distant to, to failure and just doesn't work. And that's what I hear from the thousands of customers that, that we have. What you need to do, and this is what we provide as a, as a company with thousands of customers around the globe, you actually need to take the AI technology, infuse it with a lot of information, the historical data that is domain specific, from different uh, tens of billions of past interactions with consumers in order to make it work in this environment. And you need to have it highly specialized for the customer service space in order, A, for consumers to enjoy it uh, in the right way, and B, for brands to actually trust the uh, technology and make sure it works as one of their employees, if you would like, and not just as someone uh, that is not familiar with the brand or with the different business goals that they have. Now, Barak, you have customers over a number of different industry areas, the likes of American Airlines, Morgan Stanley, Radisson Hotels. Are you seeing much difference in the speed at which various sectors are integrating AI into what they do? So I, I would say, you know, I, I, think we, I talk with customers on a regular basis, and it's kind of divided into two camps. One that says, you know, I'm not going to deploy it in my environment. It's too dangerous for us. And the others that are excited towards, you know, deploying AI, but they just want to do it in a safe and trusted way that their consumers can, can do. And, and we see it across, as you said, we operate across almost all verticals with thousands of customers around the, uh, the globe. But since they have our platform, uh, which we call uh, CX1, it allows them to uh, you know, experience AI and edit in a, in a safety way. But I can't say that I see main, many differences between verticals. Everyone understands today that customer service is the way for brands to differentiate from one another. It's a true competitive differentiation. So the excitement is there. It's just about making sure it is deployed, deployed correctly and doesn't fire back. Barack, uh, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thank you again for joining me at such an early uh, time of the day and also because you had your results out yesterday, which must have been very uh, tiring as well. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. That's it from me. I'm back on Monday at 10 o'clock. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up next, it's Sam Washington with all the latest on that court appearance from Pakistan for the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Thanks very much for joining me today. Have a good weekend. Cheerio.